Hello, I am David Baltimore. I am a professor at the California Institute of Technology, Caltech, uh, and I'm here to talk about viruses. Uh, I've worked on viruses now for 50 plus years, and I find them fascinating. Um, and I'll concentrate on HIV because it's the virus most people know. Um, and of course, it's the scourge of the 20th and 21st century. So I call viruses a separate kingdom of the living world. They're not really a kingdom, but they're so different from any other organism that they should be considered very separate. They're extremely tiny. They can only duplicate themselves by penetrating into living cells and diverting the cell's activities towards the ends that are dictated by the genetics of the virus. And thus, they are obligate cellular parasites. Uh, viruses can only exist once cell could only exist once cells uh, have evolved. They can have either RNA or DNA as their genetic material. The rest of the biological world uses DNA. Um, and they can grow in all kinds of cells, in animal cells, in bacteria, in plants. Uh, and the fact that so many of them are RNA viruses suggests that they're left over from an RNA world, uh, which was an intermediary in the evolution of the world we know today, which is based on both DNA and RNA. The central dogma of molecular biology hasn't changed uh, in, uh, since the 1950s, when it was first uh, enunciated by Francis Crick, and that is that DNA can duplicate itself, it can be transcribed into RNA, and that RNA can, in turn, be a template for making protein, and protein is what makes life work. Uh, all of our cells are built out of proteins. All of the events of our lives are determined by proteins. In 1970, I was working on a virus and had the good fortune to make a discovery that changed the central dogma slightly. Uh, we discovered reverse transcription, uh, RNA giving rise to DNA, um, and that reverse transcription uh, actually gives rise to a very large amount of the DNA of us and of most higher organisms. The discovery of reverse transcription filled out our understanding of the logic of how viruses multiply. Uh, and let me describe that logic uh, by focusing on the most important product that's made during a virus infection, which is messenger RNA. Messenger RNA uh, encodes protein, and those proteins, now viral proteins, can take over a cell, can uh, make more virus particles. Uh, they are the essence of the virus infection process. And so the, the nucleic acid, the DNA or RNA, of the virus is holding the instructions for making those proteins. And the question is, how do those instructions get to making protein? And there are really six ways that that can happen, uh, depending on exactly how the instructions are transmitted. Uh, and uh, those six ways distinguish one class of viruses from another class of viruses. So the, the most a uh, simple, straightforward one are the double-strand DNA viruses, class I viruses. Uh, those uh, simply make messenger RNA just like we make messenger RNA in our normal cells, because we carry double-strand DNA as our hereditary material. Then there are single-strand DNA viruses. They have to become double strands. Those are the class II viruses. Uh, and then they can make messenger RNA. Uh, and then they have to make, again, those single strands to be the genetic material of those viruses. Then there are RNA viruses. Uh, there are double-strand RNA viruses, very similar to the double-strand DNA viruses, except they're RNA. Uh, 
uh, and they make messenger RNA from their double-stranded RNA. There are two kinds of single-strand RNA viruses. They can either carry the sense strand, uh, which we call the plus strand, of uh, genetic material, in which case they can encode protein by just putting that into the cell, or they can, in the class 5 viruses, carry the minus strand, the complementary strand, that's senseless until it's copied into a plus strand, and so it needs to be copied before it can make protein. And the virus particle has to carry a polymerase to do that. And then there's the reverse transcription process in which an RNA is carried by the virus, but it, it's copied into first single-strand DNA, then double-strand DNA, and that then is the template to make messenger RNA. So that gives us six different kinds of viruses. I call them... Uh, it's called the Baltimore classification uh, because we first enunciated it back in 1970, and many textbooks use it as a way of organizing thinking about viruses, uh, and... Uh, but it really isn't a classification. It's a statement of how viruses fit their style of handling genetic information into the needs of the central dogma. Now, how many viruses are there? There are an uncountable number of viruses. Every animal in the animal kingdom has its own set of viruses. Every bacterium has its own set of viruses. There are certainly a million viruses uh, that are easily distinguishable one from another, and many estimates have been made that are much higher than that. Because viruses can only grow inside cells, uh, they have to get into a cell, but once they get in there, they can very quickly take over the cell. Uh, some viruses, particularly of bacteria, have a life cycle of only 20, 30 minutes. Um, and uh, even mammalian viruses take only a few hours to make enormous numbers of copies of themselves. They can continue to live only if they're passed on from one organism to another, because being obligate parasites, they can't live out in the world on their own. Uh, and so every virus is a story of transmission. Uh, we know that transmission in humans can involve sneezing or touching a surface that a sick person has touched. Um, but for uh, cats, uh, the transmission is different. For insects, the transmission is different. And that's part of the evolution of viruses. They evolve to become part of the living style of their hosts. If viruses are very particular to a species, like the human species, then we can actually get rid of them, because they have no reservoir outside of us. And so if we can vaccinate the whole population of the world, then we can get rid of uh, that virus, uh, because we make ourselves immune to it. And we've done that with smallpox, and we've almost done that with polio. Um, and uh, they, they believe that within a couple of years, polio will be eliminated from the Earth. Now, viruses growing inside cells, for them to get out of cells, they got to do something. Uh, and they do one of two things, generally. Either they bud out from the surface of cells, and that's what this picture shows, or they uh, grow up to large numbers inside the cell, and then they burst the cell open. Uh, and that liberates virus particles from the cell interior into wherever it is, into the blood system, bloodstream in the humans, for instance. Viruses only made sense when molecular biology was born as a science, because they're so small that the only really important thing that they have is their genetic instructions, their DNA or their RNA. They generally protect that in a coat, uh, but the code is, is largely inert, except for helping them get into the next infected cell, or next cell that they're going to infect. Um, some of them have 
a few other proteins that help initiate the infection. And then we're now learning about viruses that are very big and complicated, surprising. They're actually of the size of bacteria. Uh, but what distinguishes them is that they require to be inside a cell to multiply, whereas bacteria can multiply as free living organisms. The way we detect viruses is by what's called a plaque assay. We have a lawn of, of susceptible cells. They could be mammalian cells, they could be bacterial cells. We put a few virus particles down. Those virus particles chew up the lawn from a center where they land, and they form a plaque. And if you count the number of plaques, you know how many viruses were there. And if you make, if you put down twice as many viruses, you get twice as many plaques. So it's a highly quantitative test. And bacterial genetics was done using those, those uh, techniques. Here we can see uh, tiny plaques made by a, a kind of bacterial virus or huge plaques uh, made by poliovirus uh, plated on human cells. A distinction which I find very important among viruses is the distinction between equilibrium viruses and non-equilibrium viruses. Equilibrium viruses uh, have, are viruses that have been for a very long time parasites of a particular species. And so they're highly adapted to that species, to the lifestyle of that species, to the cells of that species. And what happens is that they evolve to actually be less lethal because they don't want to kill off their host. If they killed off every member of the species, that virus would, have, would die itself. And so they cause enough disease to help their spread, but they don't like causing sneezing or coughing, but they don't kill most people. The common cold virus is a very good example of a, an equilibrium virus in humans. Then there are non-equilibrium viruses. Non-equilibrium viruses are viruses that have jumped from one species to another. They're not yet adapted to that new host. They've only been the, with that new host for a while even decades. And they can be extremely lethal because this is not a host they care about, and so they haven't evolved to uh, be non-lethal in that host. They may, in fact, spread poorly or they could sp spread very well. They may be very efficient, very inefficient. They're enormous variation. But those are the viruses that cause us the biggest problems because those viruses can be lethal. So if we talk about equil equilibrium viruses, we talk about polio. Polio in its day um, caused, was, was lethal to a very small fraction of the people who were infected by it. Most people didn't know they were infected, 90% plus. Few people actually were paralyzed by it, uh, and a few people were actually killed by it. Uh, and that's a, the nature of an equilibrium virus, largely non-lethal, although occasionally lethal. Smallpox actually was, is, is a, a, a virus that's lethal to a fair number of people, uh, and you really want to get it when you're young and get over it. Uh, and that uh, was the nature of vaccination against smallpox in the very early days. Common cold virus, uh, we mentioned measles virus. Another one actually causes quite severe infections to a few people. Most people get over it after being in bed for a couple of days. Herpes viruses are all around us um, and are keep infecting people, but uh, are generally non-lethal. Now, non-equilibrium viruses, the most famous one, uh, of those is influenza virus. It's a natural virus of birds. Uh, in birds, it's generally not very lethal. Uh, 
uh, it comes to humans and it's lethal to older people and very young people. Um, and it's really a serious disease for adults um, to get. And that's why we try to vaccinate against it, uh, although our vaccines are nowhere near as good as we'd like them to be. HIV is a virus that recently came to us from chimpanzees, but in fact is not even a natural virus of chimpanzees. It seems to be a natural virus of monkeys. Uh, and they gave it to chimpanzees, which in turn uh, gave it to us. SARS uh, is a virus probably from bats. Ebola is a virus almost certainly from bats. Anton was from rodents. Um, those have been very lethal to humans, but generally in, in contained areas uh, because they, they haven't evolved to be able to spread very effectively. Now, let me turn to HIV because it's a virus that we've heard so much about um, and that has been such a devastating virus to human beings. Uh, in, in the last few decades, the spread of the human immunodeficiency virus uh, throughout the world has been a constant uh, source of, of fear and news. Uh, it came into our midst uh, really in the early 1980s. Before that, it was in human beings, but it was in very limited populations, mainly in Africa. Somewhere around the 1980s, it started spreading, uh, coincident with travel. Uh, it was taken on airplanes in people from uh, its, its source in Africa into Europe, into the United States. Uh, making sense of, of HIV depended on having discovered the reverse transcriptase. So our work in 1970 actually set the base for finding HIV because HIV it uses a reverse transcriptase and it was that enzyme that revealed the nature of that virus. So HIV is the classic non-equilibrium virus. It's, as I say, endemic in African monkeys. It got a foothold in the human populations maybe 90 years ago. For a long time, it was found only in villages in Africa. Then, as, tra as uh, transportation uh, became more and more commonly used to take people from one continent to another, it seeded other continents uh, and became a worldwide ep epidemic. It grows in one of the key cell types of our immune system, and so it actually knocks out our immune systems, and that's what, why it's a lethal virus. We die of some infection, uh, not of HIV infection. Uh, and with that, uh, I, I finished with this discussion of viruses uh, and of HIV.